Welcome to Arm Your Mind for Liberty podcast episode number one. My name is George Donnelly. I'm your host. And today my guest is libertarian activist and all around badass Jim Babb of Philadelphia. We're going to be talking about how he nullified a suspicionless checkpoint in a Philadelphia suburb. Please keep listening. So, Jim, um, tell, tell us about uh, your, the activism you did the other night. Well, we did some community service in Upper Moreland Township, which is uh, Willow Grove area. Uh, we found out about a checkpoint. Uh, you know, they call it a DUI checkpoint. We call it suspicionless checkpoint. Um, I didn't realize how big these things really were. I was thinking, you know, they're going to pull over a few cars. This was this, it was multiple agencies involved, uh, all the different townships in the area, sheriff's people, the state police. They had this entire camp set up, built up an entire Best Buy parking lot. They had a fire just truck the amount of donuts powering these, this lighting rig. They had this massive donut station. Uh, there must have been know, 30, 40 police cars uh, involved in this thing. Just, it was huge. And so um, they, they, we said, well, you know what? We found out about it in advance. So what if we went out there and stood, just stood there with some signs, you know, a couple streets beforehand and just said, hey, uh, checkpoint ahead. <laughs> Might want to exit now. So, uh, so we did that. And, uh, a l I mean, a lot of people took our advice. I, I, we, we lost count at over 100 people that we could tell saw the sign and just made a beeline for a turn. And they're like honking and waving. And, uh, you know, we could tell it was generally well received by the community. So it's really rewarding. <laughs> That's excellent. So how, how many people uh, came out for that? Uh, we had eight, so, which is a good number because we could split up. And, you know, and cover a water area. We were able to cover the checkpoint coming in both directions. And, you know, nobody had to be isolated or, you know, you know be in danger, you know, from police because we all had cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it worked well. They, the police, um, we were there for an hour before the police even knew we were there. <laughs> and so then they did come down. The policeman came down. He's like, uh, what are you guys doing? And, and, and we had discussed this in advance how we were going to handle it. Nobody said anything. We just looked at him. Nice. What, you don't speak English? Everybody just, you know, we're just videotaping, you know, like, does anybody speak English here? You know? <laughs> and I was like, well, my supervisor will come down and talk to you. Like, okay. So, he, later, the supervisor comes down. He's like, what are you guys doing? Do you speak English? And <laughs> in there. I was like, well, okay, see ya. And, he, and they had to, you know, they had to slink off unfulfilled, you know, but it was, uh, it was pretty, it was a good, it was a perfect way to handle them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later I, I had my cop block t-shirt on and I said, you know, I'm just going to walk up through the checkpoint just to see, you know, videotape the checkpoint. And I, I that's when I realized the scale of this operation. I mean, it, it was just massive. And uh, it turns out they stopped about a thousand cars that night. Wow! And um, they, didn't, they didn't make any arrests until one p.m. I mean one a.m. So we had been out there for for over three hours and basically prevented them from getting a single arrest during that time. Nice. Uh, which we found out compared to the last time they did this was we we probably cost them between 10 and 20 arrests for being there. Nice. So, uh, um, you know, that's, if that's 10 or 20 people that went home to their families instead of going to a cage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it might not end the police state tomorrow, but, uh, you know, it certainly saves some people's butts, which is uh, incredibly important, you know, because, you know, the, the incredible suffering, the cost and all that of going to jail is, uh, you know, 
That was that was an, an incredible contribution that you guys made. Any advice for people who'd like to reproduce this in uh, in their community? Well, the hard part is finding out where these checkpoints are going to be. Um, we kind of locked into the information, and we're, we're aware of about four or five more coming up this summer that we're going to be doing this at. Um, you know, with, with, if you don't know in advance, it's really hard to prepare and have your signs and volunteers ready. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was kind of a lucky break for us. But, um, you know, maybe there's more ways to find out. Uh, you know, they're really not too shy about the information. And maybe, maybe you could just, you know, call up your local police and be like, hey, do we have any DUI checkpoints? You know, I'm, I'm a concerned citizen. What do you, you know, or I'm doing some research on, uh, a DUI checkpoint. So there are any coming up? Um, you know, you know, they'll probably just be, oh, of course, we're, you know, we're doing our duty here. We're going to be, <laughs> we'll be taking down citizens this weekend. I don't, I don't know. Um, some places have them more often than others. I, I rarely see them. Mm -hmm. It's just going about my business. I, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever driven through one. Um, you know, but so may depend on your area if it's something they like to do a lot. A lot of states it's illegal. They just can't do it. So, uh, but it is, it's horrible. I mean, uh, the, the, I've heard stories. Um, we had a, somebody that observed one of these, the, the first one, and he, he, he was telling me stories about, oh, they're, um, you know, it's not like drunk, you know, staggering out of their car, you know, being taken to jail. They're people that went through the checkpoint because they, they said, oh, I'll take, sure, I'll take the breathalyzer. I'm not impaired. Yeah. And, and the standard is so low that, you know, it turns out, oh, you just destroyed my yes, you are. <laughs> and, you know, they go, you know, just regular, you know, couples, young people, doesn't matter. They just, you know, <laughs> it was horrifying. People crying, um, you know, because it does. It ruins, you know, not only does it ruin their night, they go to jail. They could possibly lose their license, Officer. which could impact their job, mm -hmm. uh, they impact future employment situations, the legal fees, possible Officer, probation. I mean, this is just a, this is a nightmare. That yeah, and a DUI ca still carries a lot of stigma, right? Yeah, no, I, I I think it does, and you know, to to most people that don't understand, they think, oh, DUI, you got all sloshed and you know, and, and putting people in danger. You know, that's probably what people believe a DUI is. But um, with a little, little bit of research, you realize that there's hardly anybody like that. I mean, and so it's it's really just people that are, you know, I think it's like 0 .08 or something is the technical limit. It's just a fundraising operation. That's all it is. Yeah. And, you know, and this even this was just, I think, an excuse to, to blow – grant money or something like there's no way even with all the fines that they're bringing in from a handful of arrests could have paid the salaries of 40 cops and all those donuts and all those cars and the lighting rig and the police are you know like and the the fire rig and it's just uh but um i've also found out that uh for people that are concerned about drunk drivers um uh, standard patrols are far more effective Oh yeah. That these all the, the putting all these cops in one place and waiting uh -huh. for a drunk to come to them. Just normal patrols where where, you, where they drive around and they look for somebody weaving. That's where that's you, where did you hear that? Uh, I I was quoted. Um, I saw heard quotes from the American Beverage Institute. Now, granted, I sort of take that with a grain of salt um, because they're sort of representing the <laughs> uh, <laughs> beverage providers. But I mean, it, it also in, makes an intuitive sense to me that um, you know, yeah, forty cops in one place versus you know, what if you just took half of those cops and just had them driving around with their eyes open and looking for people that might actually be posing a danger? Yeah, I mean, it does seem more intuitive because if they send everybody to one spot in the city, well, then the other ninety-nine percent of the city is you know, how much coverage does that have, right? Yeah, I mean, so um, so when people say, "Well, gosh, what do you you know? You must like DUIs." You know, like, 
Really, I, mean, I don't want people to. I don't want people to be put in danger. I don't want anyone to be. Uh, you know, I don't want people to have accidents. I want people to be responsible. Uh, but the system we have is so far removed from trying to protect people that you know anything we can do to. You know, we need to protect people from that system. So that's why I kind of like this operation uh, because it really. It's, I mean, you get immediate feedback. You know, it's like so many libertarian operations are educational. There's a theoretical benefit down the line, or mm -hmm. even with um, like uh, jury nullification pamphleting. You're sort of, you know, hoping, you know, that you end up with the right jury and you might have an impact. You, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, but here, it's like, yes, <laughs> you know, there's a save. there's another save. There's another save. And it's really rewarding just to have that immediate, immediate feedback, and 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 know that okay, um, you know, people didn't go to jail tonight because because we were willing to stand out there. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's a really good investment for for our time as activists. And uh, I was really proud of the group that that came out to do it. Um, I mean, it was late at night. Some had to travel a fair amount, and we've all got something better to do on Friday night, but. Uh, but it was pretty fun, though. So I, I, I highly, I'm really impressed. I, I thought that was really an excellent effort that you guys made. You know, just impressive. Like you said, it's so effective. You know, and you saved people that night. Yeah, I mean, how how often do you get to push back against the police state in an in an, in an effective way? It's so much like, ouch, quit it, ouch, quit it, ouch, quit it. It's like, I just, it, it's it's just. It's just nice to see, uh, you know, like people, you can actually have, a, you can put a little dent in it, you know, just for one night in one place. Um, and, you know, they had, I mean, literally, they had 40 or 50 people on the scene. We had eight, mm -hmm. okay? And so their resource investment was, was so much higher than ours. Um, but it, But our reward, you know, was way higher. I mean, we probably had, you know, $50 in materials <laughs> and some man hours. And so, you know, um, if you save 20 arrests, you got to figure they make at least a thousand dollars off of each arrest at least. So you denied right. them with your little small investment, you denied them at least $20,000. It's possible not to mention all, all the lawyers, mm -hmm. all the probation officers, all the administrative people all you know all the, the stuff that goes along with that mm -hmm. um, you know the the probation monitoring <laughs> I mean you know the the driver's license statement fee that'll you know maybe they'll have to eventually pay later but mm -hmm. uh, so um, we're gonna be doing it again and I'm curious to see how they adapt because I, I got word that they were pissed they were really frustrated with their poor hunting results. They were, <laughs> they were really <laughs> oh, sad. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, you know, we know that they're already plotting how to get you guys. They're already investigating you guys. This is just how these people operate. Um, you know, so how, how do you plan to cope with that? Well, we, we took a couple of precautions to begin with. Like, for instance, try to keep our vehicles far away from the scene. Like, we didn't want... We didn't want to be <laughs> have our vehicles identified at the time, you know, and just have them follow us around. Um, one of the guys did get tailed as he was leaving, but uh, he was able to make it back to our meeting place without any without any incident, and they gave up. But uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know to what extent they'll go. I, I really, there's not much they can do. I mean, we're just people standing on a public sidewalk with a sign. Um, so and you know until you even get in a car, you're you're pretty much safe from them. At least if you're in a group with cameras. Um, what okay. I what they, did you have any kind of um, you know nighttime recording uh, tools? You know, like uh, lights for the cameras or anything. Um, you know, just the the you know the small light that's on my it's on my iPhone. You know, that was probably the only lit camera that we had. But it was a pretty well lit intersections and places we were at had a lot of street lights. Mm -hmm. um, the the thing that I um, 
the one thing they started to do towards the end of the night, as traffic died down, they had a lot more manpower to, to kind of play with. So they started bird dogging us. Um, so, you know, like we would be at an intersection and then they would put a car down that road just to see who would turn down that road after seeing our sign. Uh -huh. So we would see them and then we'd go up to the next intersection. Huh. And then they would follow us up there. <laughs> and then we'd go to the next intersection. And then he'd follow again and then we'd walk back. And so it's like, you know, they were they were adapting. They were definitely trying to to thwart our effort. Mm -hmm. But so so I figure with, with more bodies we can nullify that factor just by having somebody at every single intersect, like three intersections up yeah. from the point will we'll minimize that possibility. But, um, you know, I, I think I first saw this kind of thing. I don't know if it was, um, you know, the guys from Cop Block or Nathan Cox down in Virginia, you know, like came up with this idea, mm -hmm. you know, like of just, you know, you see the checkpoint quick, you know, get out there with your sign. Um, you know, it's like, this is really nothing new under the sun, you know, for me, but I love, love to see these, you know, I get inspired by these people, yeah. you know, like that. And, and I say, like, you know, gosh, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, so it's neat to, you know, be able to, you know, take take their idea and, and implement it here. And then we, we'll put together a video and we'll get it out there. And then hopefully other people will see that. And then, you know, and then it'll, the, these ideas will spread like that. Pick up the ball and so, run with it, yeah. Because it's easy. Mm -hmm. If I was, you know, I wish I was up there and I could participate in this stuff because I, I think it's really innovative and, it, like you said, it's really effective. But if I was going to participate, uh, I would bring a lot of light, you know, any kind of light, strong light source. Because, um, you know, as I saw in one of the pictures, you guys were below a street light, but all around that street light, it was dark. And so, yeah. you know, they, they hatch their plot to frame somebody and they pull you out into the dark and then it's, you know, their word against yours. You know, the camera's not right. going to record it there. Um, you know, so I think true. literally you have to bring the light to, the, to these situations, you know, uh, otherwise in the darkness anything can happen, right? Right. I mean, where we were was pretty well lit, but you're right. They can easily pull you off to the side where it is dark. Um, you know, in some of the pictures that we took, it looks really dark because the reflective tape on the signs is so bright that the camera, uh, um, the camera compensates, you right. know, with the overall aperture. Makes but, uh, but still, though, that's a, it's an excellent point because it's so easy for them to say, "You guys step over here. We're going to talk to you," and it would be dark at that. Point. Also, next time, um, I'm going to try to have somebody just sit down right in the middle of the checkpoint with a camera. Tra just right in the checkpoint and stay there the whole time. Just filming, filming the actual checkpoint as it happens. Uh, <laughs> well, that <laughs> maybe even putting some signs right in the check. You know, like you have a right to remain silent. You know, on a big sign and just stand there right in the middle of their action. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely going to need a few backup uh, backup videographers for that one. <laughs> You know, but it, it, in a way, it's so public that it really, you know, it, it creates its own safety factor by the fact that it is so public. Um, you know, I, I'd be a lot more scared just encountering a couple cops like on a regular sidewalk somewhere than, than this. So, um, you know, the, it'd be interesting to see what they try to do to run us off. I mean, they're... I'm sure they've had a meeting already. Like, wait a minute, this is this is blowing our whole operation. <laughs> a couple of guys with signs. Who do they think they are? Oh uh, yeah, they always respect. <laughs> All right, Jim. Well, uh, you know, I wish you guys, uh, you know, a happy time there in Porkfest, and I thank you very much for uh, participating in this. I'm going to publish it uh, this coming week, and uh, really good to see you and uh, and chat with you. Great, great to see you, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry you're not joining us at Pork Fest. It's not going to be the same without you, but maybe maybe next year we'll get you up here. I'm a little a little bummed about it, yeah, and so is Clark. 